Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to Race to Zero, how to define a sustainability plan for Italy. It's an initiative promoted by Itachi together with BCG. We're in Milan at the BCG headquarters near the Duomo, and uh, Italy is now being a, at a crossroad talking about the future and sustainability. We uh, opened you for climate, and uh, in, on Thursday we will also have uh, pre-COP meetings, and then in November we'll have the COP26 meeting. We hope that Glasgow will be a success. And the current commitment by our governments, if, even if they were to be fully fulfilled, they will not be able to zero set emissions by 2050 or keep uh, uh, temperature under control. So we need to speed up change. We will need major investments, but also new technology solutions in all domains, but more specifically in the energy world. The future of energy, infrastructure, manufacturing, information technology, they will all play a role. This is what we are going to talk about. New technology solutions and the relationship between public and private enterprises has to change to help decarbonizing our planet. We will do so with highly knowledgeable specialists, industry leaders, with the Minister of Ecologic Transition, uh, Mr. Cingolani, and uh, I would kindly ask uh, to join me Lorena Della Giovanna, and uh, is the, uh, she's uh, Deputy Chief Environmental Officer, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Itachi, and Chief Executive for Italy. Welcome, Lorena. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning. Well, good afternoon to all of you. I'm really honored and I'm really somehow moved of having the chance to open today's meeting. Italy is a strategic country for a core country for Itachi, but it's a special country for me too because I am Italian. Last year I had to move to Tokyo to uh, act as executive, chief executive officer, and unfortunately, because of COVID, I could not travel back as often as I would have liked. And so being back now makes me very happy, and being with you today makes me very happy. Let me thank all the speakers and the attendees today, those who are attending in presence and those who are attending from remote locations. I know it was not easy, commitments, restrictions, so I really appreciate you being with us today. Let's uh, talk about today. What do we expect today? Uh, first of all, the main objective is that of really leading constructive discussions on the importance of investing in uh, rolling out a sustainable society. What are the stages to get there? Italy is indeed a focus uh, of our discussion, but we'll talk about the whole world. Uh, as Andrea was saying, uh, Co-op 26 is about to happen. We'll have ministries of uh, environment and energy meeting uh, uh, from 40 countries meeting in Milan, uh, pre-COP in Milan and then in Glasgow, the COP26. We all agree on the fact all countries are aware that we have to act, we, act to, we have to act fast. And we know that it existing technologies are not enough uh, to do this. We need to study, we need to research, we need to invest. And first and foremost, we need to uh, join forces, we need to work together, build partnerships, uh, and uh, we need to cooperate. And that's why we're here today. I've been working in Itachi for many years. It's a company that is, uh, well, it's been in the market for 110 years, so it's gone through the transformations, a lot of changes, and something has never changed. And it's uh, uh, the philosophy of being uh, socially responsible. We've always developed innovative solutions, uh, uh, cutting edge technology, but we don't do that only as a business opportunity. We do it with a special focus, that is to say, improve the society we live in, improve the quality of our life. And today, more than ever, we want to be a global leader. That's our strategy. We want to do so through our business and social innovation. We want to create value, environmental value, social value, and economic value. That's why we are principal partner in the Co-op 26 event. That's why we want to play a key role in this 
crisis that is happening. And that's why we want to be innovators for change. We want to innovate and foster climate change. We want to be able to help our clients, cities and governments going through this very difficult decarbonization phase. I think it's everyone's responsibility to live a healthy planet, a sustainable planet to our uh, uh, children, to the next generations. And I am confident that today's event is a starting point for that, so that we can uh, collaborate to come up with practical actions so that together we can find solutions so that our countries, our cities, our government will be able to uh, roll out the uh, defined, identified place. Now, uh, let me hand it over to Alistair and um, Alistair Dormer. I'm happy to share this challenge with him. And uh, Alex and Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alistair Dormer, Executive Vice President and Chief Environmental Officer with Itachi. He will uh, tell us about the uh, contribution Itachi can give to the country's decarbonization. You have the floor. Well, thank you, uh, Lorena. First, I'd like to thank uh, Boston Consulting Group for giving us the opportunity to work with them on this event today. Occasions like these are critical in bringing people together to discuss solutions to major global challenges. Most of my career at Hitachi has been spent heading up our rail business and latterly our overall mobility division. And two years ago, I moved to Tokyo, and early this year I was named Chief Environmental Officer. It is a supremely exciting opportunity for me, and a huge challenge, as Itachi has a major role to play in decarbonization. As a principal partner for COP26, our hope is that we are not just part of this momentous occasion, but our involvement inspires real climate change across the world. And that is why Hitachi signed up to the UN's Race to Zero campaign. And it's why we want to lead by example, by setting our own long-term environmental targets to become carbon neutral in all of our sites by 2030 and to achieve carbon neutrality across our entire value chain by 2050. But we realize that no, more needs to be done. More action, more commitment, and more collaboration to achieve worldwide change. And that could start right here now. The UN Environmental Programs Emissions Gap Report 2020 found that the global greenhouse Gas emissions hit a new high of 59.1 gigatons of CO2 equivalent in 2019. Should this pattern continue, the world is projected to warm by 3 to 5 degrees by 2100, with catastrophic effects on human civilization. This August, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has concluded for the first time that humans are unequivocally responsible for global warming. And what will it take to convince the world to take climate change seriously? As Hitachi, we know Italy very well, and it's a relevant part of our history. We started our activities in 1982, and it's always been one of Hitachi's key ge uh, geographies outside of Japan. Itachi's presence in Italy is char characterized by a wide geographical footprint with direct presence in 13 Italian regions and multiple business sectors. Itachi has more than 5,000 direct employees with nine production sites, 14 offices, and five research and development centers. And like Japan, Italy is renowned for its entrepreneurial spirit which has led the country to invent multiple groundbreaking technologies. We respect and admire Italy for its contribution to cutting edge technologies, many of them accelerating the ecological transition. 
Itachi solutions are applied in many business areas, from railways, mobility, through information technology and automation, to water, energy management, as well as healthcare. I strongly believe that Italy could be a champion in the energy transition, thanks to its entrepreneurial spirit and dynamism. And with the support of the Next Generation EU Fund, for Italy, it is not only about recovering the losses due to the pandemic crisis, it is about moving on from the past and not returning to the status quo. Using the words of the President of the European Commission, the Sula von der Leyen, we chose to not only repair and recover from the here and now, but to shape a better way of living for the world tomorrow. Today we have the honour to have Mr Cingolani, Minister for the Ecological Transition and a highly esteemed scientist whose research has proved fundamental in advancing Italy's research in fields such as robotics and sustainability. Over the past few months we have conducted research on the Italian economy, decarbonisation scenarios. The study gave us a list of actions and solutions, which we called our recipe for decarbonisation in Italy. It is based on four pillars, and I will introduce them and then leave the floor to our great partners and speakers. But firstly, we should consume and emit less by improving the efficiency of existing processes. This is an immediate priority because it is the simplest and is often the low-hanging fruit giving direct savings. Many advancements are coming from new technology research, but we believe that digital is the key. Being able to create transparency on waste and emissions, for example, is critical to creating a positive reinforcing loop. Second, we should increase our production of primary energy through renewable sources. Progressively changing the mix, the implications of the energy system networks, generators, users to manage these changes are large. Investments and their coordination is needed. Renewable energy has the potential and is growing, but not fast enough and we will likely miss the goal we set ourselves for 2030 by more than 20 years. I know that Italy and its government are working hard on the authorization process, and recently Europe has identified this as the important area to ensure next generation funds deployment. Italy has many natural resources, and we should use them. Water, wind, and sun. As more renewable resources are adopted, the process will become more complex and variable, with the availability of renewable energy sources potentially inconsistent and difficult to predict. Three main elements are required to manage this increasing complexity. Storage technologies, new and improved power networks, both at distribution and transmission level extensive deployment of digital technologies to ensure reliability, economic and operational energy efficiency. This is really important. Please remember that today, nearly one out of three tonnes of CO2 is deriving from the way we use our energy. The third ingredient of the recipe, once the process is efficient and the energy is clean, comes the electrification of consumption whenever it is possible and economically sustainable. This means using electricity as the main source of energy. It is the choice that the world has made already, but we need to accelerate. Let me briefly touch on the electrification of mobility. The transportation sector is responsible for 16% of global greenhouse gas and 28.6% of the Italian GHG emissions, and that's 99.5 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And at present, 
the most significant emission contribution derives from road transport, mainly cars and buses. Mobility decarbonisation is a substantial area of the Italian Recovery and Resilience Plan. But the plan goes further. On top of the environmental aspects, it also considers people's quality of life in the way a more sustainable local transport gets developed. The plan covers rail, mobility with new high-speed railways, and the introduction of green trains. Even if railway lines are already, 72% are already electrified in Italy, rail represents only 6% of the national passenger transport versus 7.9% in Europe. One of the main goals of the Italian RRP is to shift about 10% of road transport to rail by 2026. But also great attention is given to cities. Given their growth expectations, mobility stands out as an area of challenge and opportunity. For local public transport, there will be a major renewal of the obsolete bus fleet towards a low zero emission solution and installation of related charging infrastructure. Electric buses are quiet. They produce negligible emissions and consume two to three times less energy. We have all seen this happening in UK major cities. As new modalities and eco-friendly service providers emerge, transportation systems become more modular and less coordinated. We foresee a new role, mobility orchestrator. It should be able to consolidate the data from all public and private transport modes, as well as from the city's transport infrastructure on one side, and on the other, offer a customer interface with an end-to-end -end mobility option, detailing the most efficient journey possible. This is happening in major cities across the world, and also here in Italy, where we are seeing pilots emerging thanks to the Italian Recovery and Resilience Plan. The final lever of the overall receipt, when power is not an option for the so-called hard-to-abate sectors, we should adopt new low-carbon sources such as hydrogen, biofuels, synthetic fuels. The most prominent one is hydrogen that is offering many advantages when coupled with power systems. Of course, this is simpler said than done, but it is possible. On this, I'm curious to hear the opinion of Laura Cosi from IEA later on, particularly where she sees Italy's priorities. Since its publication in May, IEA's net zero by 2050 has been regarded as a milestone in the race to zero. Today we'll be able to hear more about all this from our great partners. I'm really proud and thankful to have you all here today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Per la introduzione molto esaustiva, grazie per essersi concentrato proprio sull'Italia e aver preparato già un po' il dibattito successivo. Let's go back to Italian because Alison Dormer introduced the fact that now we'll uh, interact with the International Ag Agency for, uh, for Energy. We'll talk to uh, Laura Cozzi, who is chief modeler, and when they issued their report and devoted to net to zero by 2050, they published the first complete guidance to get to, oh, guide to, to, get to 2050 with a renewable energy uh, available and at the same time a meaningful economic growth. How can we get there? How can Italy get there? Let me welcome Laura Cozzi, Chief Energy Modeler of IEA, International Energy Agency. Good afternoon, Laura. Good afternoon, Andrea. Good afternoon to all of you. And uh, big thanks to Itachi and Boston Consulting Group. 
As a Milanese, I'm really sorry I'm not there with you right now, but I'll try and do my best uh, to uh, make you feel at home. We are very sorry you're not here too, but uh, we heard from Alisa Dormer that there are threats on one hand and uh, record levels uh, in emissions in uh, 2019, and, uh, but we've also gathered that there are opportunities to be grasped. So we would like you to help us deep dive into that for our country. Um, uh, of course, I'm going to share my screen with you and make a small presentation on our funding systems. And uh, I can't share. So I'll start speaking and uh, uh, I'll do so without slides. The study we led shows you three main things. First of all, we do have the technologies uh, to cut emissions and cut them to the level to keep the, uh, planet, the planet temperature below 1.5% increase. And what are these technologies? Our colleagues from Itachi told us about them. We, can, we know how to decarbonize the electrical sector. Electricity, uh, so well, this type of domain is the, as the largest production of uh, 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 carbonized energy, but we have alternative sources. Uh, and so we have this technology, uh, which is also uh, viable from an economic standpoint. And we can therefore get the electric sector to zero emissions. Uh, we know how to do it, and we have the relevant technology to uh, implement that. At the same time, while we decarbonize the electric sector or industry, we can, of course, uh, uh, channel clean energy to our households, and we can do so much more than we do now. Uh, we could use that for public transport, public transport, private transport, electric cars, electric vehicles uh, are, one of, are the next frontier in this type of uh, challenge, in this type of development. And our um, study proves that there sh we should get to 60 million electric vehicles sold worldwide by 2030. And that is about half of uh, the sales, car sales. At the beginning of the year, we were around 6%. So when we go from four to all main automotive players, if you wish, and we add all of their plans, we get to th more than 30 million of uh, uh, expected sales of electric vehicles by 2030. So that's the second pillar. Pillar one, decarbonize the uh, electrical uh, system and then electric vehicles as a preferred way of transportation. Let's do away with fossil fuels and then energy efficiency. Uh, we have a relaunching plan focusing on maximizing the efficiency of buildings as well, uh, energy efficiency of buildings. And that is fully in line with what I've uh, mentioned so far. Investments and funding are key to relaunch the plan I've just mentioned uh, uh, to make race to zero possible for Italy too. I'm really proud as an Italian to be able to say that uh, together with the G20 presidency, we have uh, looked at how relaunch plans uh, are fully aligned with what we, with what we need uh, if we want to be uh, fully compliant uh, with a full uh, decarbonization. Uh, among the G20 countries, Italy is the one with the, one of the top scores. We are already 60% uh, uh, through the way to get to the net zero and end of the net zero race. Uh, our country has a lot of positive records, but also a couple of negative ones. And let me mention two of them. We are the country that's still exporting the largest number of uh, uh, PhDs or uh, I am in OECD countries. And, and then negative record for being attractive when it comes to investments. But the relaunch plan we are putting together is a turning point to reverse the trend for both negative indicators. And the first one tells us very clearly uh, we have very strong energy players, energy companies, and they are really 
putting a lot of effort, not just in Italy, but also globally. And these companies are leaders in renewable energies, digitalization, and networks. Therefore, we really have the opportunity to come up with a pipeline of talents of new jobs in, uh, in these industries is one of a kind. And then talking about investments, uh, the uh, ability this government has to put together this uh, um, resilience and recovery plan and the ability uh, industrial players have to actually roll out that plan makes it a as, again, as, as I said, a whatever kind moment in time for us. Uh, let me share two more key things uh, to have an ecological transition that is turned into a success. So we have to be people-centric. We have to put people at the center of our uh, work. Uh, young people who are skilled, they have to be trained, educated, to have the necessary skill to retain uh, the necessary features to be able to get all the jobs that will be created over time, but also the ability we consumers will have to be protected against market, oil market fluctuations, crude oil market uh, fluctuations, and gas market fluctuations. If we can make projections, if we can invest, have greener buildings, more energy efficient buildings, uh, drive electric vehicles, we will all be able to have energy bills that be much lower and less volatile, but also a lot cheaper. And then innovation was mentioned before, and this is a game we are playing, but it has a, a two halves. The first half is until 2030, and 30, 2030, and it's very clear we have the necessary technology. It's a matter of mobilizing investments. But after 2030, we will need innovation first and foremost. And basically, innovation is outside the uh, electric energy system, most of the innovation we will need is along all those lines that were called uh, hard to abate uh, um, industries, uh, the um, transportation industry and aviation, you name it, heavy industries. We can bet on hydrogen, we can bet on biofuels and a number of other technologies where the challenge is really open for each and every player, for each and every country, advanced countries. And uh, wrapping up, Italy can play a key role to uh, get to zero emissions. And let me say that for the first time, I would like to give you a, a more uh, uh, international perspective. Italy is wearing two hats. On the one hand, we are part of the G20 and we played that exceptionally well. Everyone's looking at Italy and uh, we'll ho wait for the uh, next summit uh, at the end of October. And then this co-chairing of the Co-op 26, giving us an opportunity to shine, to give an example somehow, to set an example. And uh, uh, as an Italian, again, I'm really, really proud. Thank you, thank you, Laura. And uh, thanks for focusing on our country and for focusing uh, your analysis, your study. Uh, one more question, Co-op 26, Glasgow, what are your expectations? How do you view this? Uh, how important is this gonna be for our future? Uh, let's say when we talk about the half, glass half full or half empty, it is an important uh, deadline uh, meeting. We've seen that uh, there are many countries that have ambitions in Europe, in China. China just said that they're going to stop financing and funding coal. Then $100 billion that advanced countries promise to developing countries. And that will be key to unlock a greater ambition also for developing countries when it comes to race to zero. The key element, that won't be the end of the game. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to the chief energy modeler of uh, e
sorry, IEA, the International Energy Agency. Now we have the Minister for Ecological Transition, Right Honorable Mr. Cingolani. Please join us. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been very busy days, I'm sure. Let me start from a picture, a snapshot we've see, that we'll see, be seeing tomorrow. It's been Mr. Cingolani with Greta Thunberg. You met at Eid for Climate. Uh, and uh, Greta was very tough. She really told you uh, very c blunt things. And you had to answer somehow. I will speak Italian, OK. I do apologize if I ask to have my contribution. Uh, it, I was one and a half hour late because of COVID tests. And it's the world, first world-class live event in presence. And it was uh, somehow uh, complex to organize. Last night, we had 50 people who got there. So I apologize for asking to speak in a different order from that of the agenda. And these young people, these young students, uh, talked uh, a different uh, language, of course. Uh, they have to somehow be disruptive in their presentation. But they raised two questions, very different ones, by the way. And Vanessa, the first activist, uh, um, she talked about uh, the fact uh, that rich countries, advanced countries, uh, have not yet put together the 100 millions of uh, billions of financial aid that they promised together uh, in a year. And then they mentioned some very, very uh, bad situations and dramatic situations in Africa. And that was really moving. So her message above and beyond telling us you must, you must, hammering us with you must, you must, you must, uh, to raise awareness. She reminded us that we are uh, um, debtors. We are insolvent uh, if, if it comes to the economic pact. We are not yet delivering on it. And then Greta said something else. I don't remember the exact words because it's the digital uh, uh, generation. They are millennials, so they have uh, a different uh, way of speaking. And she said, look at the figures. Uh, the global heating uh, warming is still growing. Uh, CO2 emissions are still growing. So there's something wrong in the system. And uh, I made an introduction that talked about the pathway that is being followed. And then uh, today I introduced something else. I said that pre-COP26, I said that at the G20 meetings. And I also said that to the international press. We can no longer talk about climate change. Uh, it, we cannot talk about global inequalities unless we also talk about uh, climate change. Who is paying the price? Who is bearing the brunt? Uh, it's countries who are uh, affected by global inequality. And um, one thing is to mitigate uh, climate uh, within G20, within COP26. Uh, and one billion people do not have no access to electricity. They don't even have fuels to cook. Or uh, their life experience is household pollution. It's not the pollution we have on the roads, for instance. So how can we discuss topics that are so global and, uh, and so sociologically, uh, they have to be uh, put together? One is coming from Africa, one or two activists. One was from Africa and the other one from Sweden. Um, they started from a different footing, but uh, it was uh, amusing. Talking to Greta, for instance, uh, she underlined, you're just saying blah, 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 saying call 26, blah, 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 but you're not doing acting. And it was, uh, uh, I had the president, the other president of COP26, he was on the big screen connected, and I told him, well, next month we'll have to do a lot of blah, blah, blah <laughs> to comply with all this. But even the young students uh, who were there, uh, um, um, Pre-COP 26, why is it so important? Uh, what is it that is at stake? How did you set up the work uh, that you're going to do? Uh, let not, uh, let's not misunderstand the importance of the Italian leadership. Uh, from uh, We have to make a distinction with uh, what the uh, COP 26 means at a uh, uh, global level. Italy now, with President Draghi, is indeed a type of country uh, that has an acknowledged leadership role. And um, so we have to really play that out well. Uh, so above and beyond who's leading what, uh, co-op 26 and pre-co-op, uh, 
between uh, G7 and G20, we have 4.8 billion people producing 80% uh, uh, of CO2, and we try and find mitigation measures. Uh, and um, it goes from energy transition to circular economy, co economies, uh, uh, re-establishing uh, uh, the balance uh, it, within oceans. Uh, and, uh, and so we have three in excess of three billion people who have no access to electricity, uh, no access to fuel, even to cook household fuel. So if you think of that, um, ecological transition in Italy and in Europe is different from uh, ecological transition in China, but the difference between our definition and the Chinese definition is much lower than uh, our definition at the G20 level and the most that of the most vulnerable countries. But G20 is 20 countries. There are another 160, 170 countries to focus on. So the big challenge of Co-op 26 uh, we have to somehow find a way through a three-dimensional issue, find a way to solve it. So we have uh, uh, social inequalities, climate change, and they are overlapping. But then we have to mitigate the effects of climate change after somehow uh, improving on uh, the situation of financial uh, inequalities. We have to have public-private partnerships. We have to transfer technology at low cost. And I think in that case, we have to have transfer of technology without having intellectual rights being paid out uh, or intellectual property rights. No one uh, has to be left behind. It's n I didn't uh, make it up myself. Somebody else uh, said that. Uh, and there are four where this is being discussed. And then uh, the future of our country that is at the center of today's initiative. And Laura Cotti reminded us that we do have the technology base and Italy can be a leader in that respect. And uh, there are resources from the, uh, the PNRR, the Italian Resilience Recovery Plan. And so technology can also uh, somehow be affected, impacted by the timeline. When, you ha when we have to have authorization for renewable energy sources, it takes a long time to get them cleared. Well, uh, there are two levels here we have to discuss. We need a clear plan. We need, where we, we need to know where we are heading. And we need better rules than the ones we have. Clear plan means uh, right now I'm trying to share this uh, with uh, everyone because uh, uh, people are not aware of its complexity. Uh, following the Paris Accords, uh, we have to uh, keep the temperature increase below uh, 2 degrees, keep it around 1.5 degrees, and that also means reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And people say, let's stop producing uh, CO2, let's do carbon capture. But according to me, the problem has to be faced uh, uh, through lateral thinking, if you wish. We will have 27 billion on energy transition over five billion over a five year time span. And that means uh, um, improving renewable uh, uh, energy components up to 70% in the total energy mix. But only if I have energy, green energy, can I change my mobility? Because of course we'll be loading batteries with energy, green energy. We uh, have to, we can change, uh, hard to change industries such as that of uh, uh, the steel industry. Uh, we can do that. Otherwise, we are still producing CO2. Uh, we will focus, we'll have to focus on electricity as well. So 27 billion over five years, 27 billions, but that's not enough. And then there's an indirect component, that of circular economy. And there we will in invest about 20 billion new plants, energy efficiency, reusing of materials, materials that are already there. They've already generated CO2. We are reusing and recycling to uh, indirectly reduce CO2 emissions. And here we have to take the country to 
a better level of uh, waste sorting and differentiation. About 80% selected waste treatment and collection, and it's technology that, that we have. It's not handmade, so that 65% of waste is fully recycled. That's why we need to sort, scientifically sort waste, and no more than 10% actually sent to landfills. You know that landfills now are a huge environmental problem that we are dealing with, but this would be a real turnaround, a revolutionary, a disruption in a, uh, in a country that produces a lot of waste, per capita waste. And then uh, we have to find a system that best captures uh, CO2, ocean, land, and forest. They are the best CO2 uh, captors and the best uh, oxygen producers. So we have to invest uh, health state of oceans, uh, health state of land, uh, uh, recovery of uh, uh, farmland, deforestation, these are all issues. It's a three-legged technology. So if the active reduction, passive reduction, semi-active, we can get to 55% decarbonization by 2030. That is a clear method from a technical standpoint. But then we have to roll it out. And uh, there, the average time to get a, a, an authorization for renewable energy is 1,200 days uh, because we have to assess the environmental impact. Once you get with the uh, technical plan, there was a new law that passed, uh, and it's the simplification law decree. So the average time for authorization goes from 1,200 to 250 days, which is in line with international authorization uh, timings. Uh, of course, we still have to carry out all the necessary checks. And now we have uh, releasing a roadmap for tenders, for bids and calls for tender, for the installation of new and renewable source energy. Investors will have a five-year uh, time plan with all the uh, dates for the calls for tender. If you can't manage today, you'll know that soon there'll be new auctions, and you can plan your action as a company to take part to bid in the next auction. So uh, at times uh, in the past, we had uh, uh, very roughly put together projects, but uh, and so investors were not really keen. But now we have to come up with better public-private partnerships. Uh, so we'll need technology, innovation, a different relationship uh, to the industry. We are uh, at the headquarters of a large multinational group, uh, global group. What do you expect uh, um, industry to, to do to uh, enhance uh, innovation and generate innovation. I don't have any specific expectation in this respect. Uh, it depends on where you live. It's a reverse type of relationship. It's not that the country expects something from the citizen. It's the citizens who have to expect something from their country. We've put together a very challenging plan with very simple rules. So I think we delivered on that. We fulfilled our duty. And uh, you're all specialists here, but installing 70 gigawatts of renewable energy in the country means installing 8 gigawatt per year. You know how much Italy is installing now? One tenth, 0.8 per year. So we are talking, it, the, it has to be multiplied by 10 speed wise, so it's not trivial, so to say. And uh, we laid the foundations for this to happen, and, and for many others as well. And uh, in the same way, I'm sure that companies and players are already uh, competing for their sustainability reports. They deliver sustainability reports, and they started talking about it and discussing it even before we did. So large corporations are aware, and citizens are aware. They are bombarded with this information, uh, information flow. And uh, we've had... Uh, uh, tornadoes uh, taking place, uh, uh, roofs being uh, uncovered, and uh, catastrophic events. And uh, we already had information as to between 2010 and 2019, we had 400,000 uh, uh, deaths uh, due to catastrophic events. 
tied in with global warming. So, uh, and that really led to huge expenditure as well for governments. Uh, companies are working along those lines. The governments are doing their best. They are committed to deliver. There's a great European awareness in that respect. And, and I think this is already a good step. You is producing 9% of CO2. Even if we were all to become green tomorrow, we would only uh, do away with 9%. There are countries who are uh, producing a lot more. So we have to talk them. We need to uh, really engage in a moral suasion exercise to uh, make sure less and less CO2 is emitted. I've seen a leap forward because nobody, no country was in doubt as to uh, join uh, the Paris Accords or not. Now it's a matter of deadlines of data and of uh, uh, scheduling of uh, the different uh, uh, timelines. And I hope everyone will commit. Uh, we heard from the International Energy Agency, and Laura Cotti told us we have the uh, tools. We will have a, um, lower energy bills, but instead in Italy we are told that our gas bill or oil bills will uh, increase. Uh, so the public at large is worried uh, of the breakthroughs, but also of the turmoils that will take place uh, at national level when that happens. How can you strike a balance between the fact that we need to speed up, but also our productive system has to adapt to these new systems? So how do we strike a balance there? I think we always try to start from figures. The increase in uh, the, uh, commodities price, uh, gas for instance, uh, to an 80% increase in the gas bill, in the energy bill. I don't know whether you can call that lack of production or something else. If the gas price increase, our manufacturing costs more. And that's four-fifth of the uh, impact on the energy bill. And then you have CO2 price that can be tied in with ecological transition. Uh, so we um, should not give the wrong message. It's not ecological transition that makes our energy bills higher. It's only 20%. So if we do away with uh, uh, fossil fuels, we won't have to pay CO2 and we won't have to pay gas price increases. But doing away with fossil fuels means going through a thermodynamic uh, revolution and, but that would still not be enough. It would have to be accumulated. It would, be, it would have to be consistent. It's not that we can only use solar or wind energy. If we talk about transition, it's called transition because it's a transitory phenomenon and it requires time. How fast we are, it will depend on how uh, good we'll be in dealing with the red tape and bureaucracy. And after five years of growth, we have COVID. So it will very much depend how we'll roll out new technologies. There will be new technologies to roll out. So uh, I have to go from A to B. I can go a linear path or sublinear path. I start slow and then I speed up or I speed up and then uh, uh, slow down or fall down. So um, this depends on a number of factors. And if it were easy, we would have done it already, be sure, rest assured. We have to monitor everything, how economy performs, how installations perform, uh, fuel prices. There are some technologies that are working well. And in real time, we have to have the ability to adapt. So we started with a picture of you and Greta. I want to close with another um, picture just before the summer, July, Naples, G20. Uh, energy G20, and then uh, uh, Cingolani with Kerry and others uh, working, uh, uh, rolling their sleeves up to find an agreement on uh, on a press communique uh, to be uh, disclosed. A few weeks after Milan, you'll go to Glasgow, you'll start again. And let me ask you, uh, where will it be most difficult to find an agreement? Where will you really have to roll your sleeves up and uh, sweat a lot? Will it be the cost of transition? Will it be the different challenges? Where, um, what will be the uh, point that will make a difference and turn Glasgow into a success or a failure? Glasgow is a lot more complex than the G20. As I said at the beginning, 
it's, uh, we have to consider Co-op 26. Uh, Co-op 26 has a lot of factors. There are major differences between G20 and Co-op 26. The larger the differences, the, the more differences there are, the more difficult it is to find a, a short term uh, balance. We have mitigation and adaptation in our agenda. The problem is there, I have to adapt. And so far, this is what we have to do, and we have to make it as little painful as possible. Uh, of course, let's hope that tomorrow from uh, adaptation, we will move on to prevention. Uh, let's try and prevent. Uh, it means R&D, it means research and innovation, but that could be a good result. Already. The second major chapter in, chap in COP26 is is finance, green finance, public pa um, private partnerships, uh, the um, ethical finance, uh, and uh, unless we uh, are able to give them the right pathway to follow, uh, they won't help us. Uh, uh, we cannot tell people you cannot grow because if you grow, you generate, you produce CO2. So we have to be aware of the fact, and Co-op 26 will do, the role of finance, the role of private investors has to become a uh, driver to overcome inequalities. And accepting that and being aware of that is a lot already. And then it would be nice to put together the famous 100 billion to be uh, shared with less developed countries. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Cingolani. Thank you very much for providing us with the picture of the game that we're playing in and its consequences and the critical points. Now we're going to focus on the future of green infrastructures, the role for our countries, the global role, decarbonization, and I would like to ask Claudio Fachin, Senior VP and Executive Officer of Itachi, CEO of Itachi ABB Power Grids. Cosmo Penzaki, Executive Vice President, Hydrogen SNAM, and Vera Fiorani, CEO, Rete Ferroviaria Italiana. Welcome to all three of you. Mrs. Fiorani is connected. Sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Cosmo Penzaki is connected with us. Sorry, Mr. Chor is connected with us on the screen. So how do you actually see the challenge that we're trying to represent with Minister Cingolani and the International Agency, Energy Agency, using technology to make a big step forward? You are in a key industry because renewable energies are produced in one place and consumed somewhere else. And interconnection is one of the biggest challenges. How do you see this challenge and which are your plans today? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say that we've heard from Laura and Mr. Cingolani how important technology is. So it's a long-term critical issues, and the leaders in technology have to go on investing and innovating. But we believe that there is sufficient technology to do many of the things we've heard about, starting now all the way to 2030. A key point is innovating also in terms of cooperation, partnerships, development of business models that allow for the acceleration in the use of these technologies. Secondly, thinking about the future, 2030 and 2050 as well, we can identify three different areas, talking about the value chain of energy. We have production, and it is clear that we must go towards renewable energy sources. But it is clear that renewable energy sources alone are not enough. Then we have the use of energy. Clean energy is synonym of electricity. Efficiency, 
and consumption reduction is an essential part which must be managed by incentives to improve efficiencies. And then we've got that area in between, which is often neglected, which is that of developing systems, developing an efficient electric network or electricity network that is reliable and manages to distribute all the electricity which will be produced in a more distributed and a more reliable way compared to what we use today. And that will be consumed also in a different way, in a more distributed way with new emerging needs. So the three building blocks must be at the center of the transition. And we have heard many ideas as how this can be made possible with public-private partnerships to provide the necessary investments, resources, and talents that we need. Well, the reason word that you have mentioned, which I believe is particularly significant, the speed in the implementation. I mean, this challenge requires acceleration. And we have spoken with our minister. We have spoken with the IEA representatives. I mean, you can't just focus on the past. So which are the priorities for you right now? Well, as we've heard before, it is true, acceleration is paramount. But as I told you before, we have many technologies. What we need is more innovation from the viewpoint of permitting, of cooperating with the governments, with the lawmakers, so that we can actually cut down by five times the permitting times and implementation times. And then it is necessary to go on working together Everyone must play his or her role. And I absolutely agree on the idea of working together. So if we go on trying to find a vertical solution, we will never get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you are the first ones who've managed to invest money on the plan for recovery and resilience, 2 billion euro in a world which is sustainable by definition because the railways have always been viewed as the most sustainable transport modality. But how do you see this challenge now? I mean, there are many different opportunities. We've heard reassuring messages. We've got the technology. We can make it. So we should not just think it's going to be a catastrophe full stop. So which is your contribution? Well, we contribute in the sector of the mobility of people and goods. So we do not move energy, but we move people and goods. And we do this on the railway, which has always been viewed as the most sustainable mobility modality. So any effort you make to move people and goods from the roads or other ways of transport towards the railway certainly improves the sustainability of the whole national and European system. So this is something that has been understood in Europe and has been transferred into the strategy specifically in the plan of investments for the railway structure, which is part of the resilience plan. And we'll envisage 23 billion euro investments by the year 2025 with three main fields, development of uh, railway structures for high speed trains, i.e. passengers, many investments to promote intermodality, i.e the possibility of changing systems of transport with the manifold connections, with ports, harbors, railways, to facilitate through a combination of different transport modalities the shift towards the railway. And then the third field is the accessibility of railway stations. Railway stations must be easily accessible. 
We've got 2,200 of them. And whichever way we find them, we're working on this. And we have gotten 700 million from the National Plan of Resilience and Recovery. So we invest this money to make sure that everybody can get to a railway station with any means that can be left there. There's a soft mobility, a soft mobility mechanism allowing the people to get on the train. The more we can do this, the more we will have to be able to manage the increased number of people using our trains. And we already do have some infrastructure supporting train circulation, and our guest here is one of our most important partners. And we know that adequate technology will allow us to manage in an effective and efficient way this increased traffic, the higher quantity of trains, which will be the consequence of the investments made within the National Resilience and Recovery Plan. Thank you very much. So there are many innovations also regarding your relationship with your suppliers and partners. I mean, you have mentioned parameters which are consistent with the IRR, uh, also regarding tenders, for instance. And also in this field, attempts are made to speed up procedures, to accelerate also the development of relationships between the public and private sector. Well, we have benefited from rules that have accelerated the implementation of processes. I'm talking about tools and instruments, new tools and instruments that aim at the development of sustainable projects. So projects that even before the tender is organized uh, highlight and focus on sustainability. This will have to be debated jointly through an exchange with our stakeholders, which used to have a pretty gloomy view of the railway in the past. So we need new tools for designing and planning. We need an open debate with public opinion, and we need the acceleration of tenders. But also in this field, new rules have been defined aiming at guaranteeing gender equality with the employment of young people and women. So all our tenders starting from August, and we have a total of 55 tenders by the end of October for a total of 6 billion euro uh, in terms of investments on the market. Well, all these tenders will be characterized by these constraints that go towards the direction of gender and generation sustainability. Thank you very much. And now we would like to know uh, how Enel, a multinational energy company that has focused on sustainability and has actually extended the horizon for the recovery plan uh, to another uh, 10 years. So I don't see Mr. Chara any longer on the screen. Oh, there he is. So I would like to know more about your opinion of net zero 2050. Well, the energy transition can be seen as a huge difficulty or something that can be opportunity. This happened in 1916 to the people who were producing ice when Frigidaire was founded because a General Motor directive realized that was not a bloodshed, but it was an opportunity. And those who followed him produce wealth, jobs, and a better world because meat can be preserved in our fridges. And then, of course, they invented much more. And so the co-founder of General Motor is the same person who actually incorporated Frigidaire, the company that invented the fridges, as we have them in our houses today. So the energy transition is a huge opportunity, in our opinion. And I hope that our country will recognize it as such. It is not a threat, because we have to safeguard jobs. It is an opportunity, because we can create many jobs. 
it is an economic opportunity because today renewable energies and digital networks are in the money in the sense that it is convenient to produce energy by renewable sources and they're also appealing to investors. It is an environmental necessity and it is a social opportunity because there are no big players in some of these key sectors of energy transition. So if we wait, we just miss the train. And we lose money by definition because there is a cost related to not adopting transition, which is the cost Greta Thunberg refers to, but it is also a business cost. If you come late, you're a follower. If you're a follower, you won't enjoy the scaling economy that Enel enjoys today because we started focusing on renewable sources back in 2009 with Enel Green Power, where the company with the biggest installed capacity of renewable sources worldwide because we innovated. We decided to ride innovation and we had that scale economy that made us the leader. Of course, we're still humble, but many other Italian companies can become, and it is irrelevant to me if it is them or others, but they can become the leaders in hydrogen, network flexibility solution, independent of batteries as we know them today, leaders in the resilience solution of the system. There's so many new products and services that can be developed with technologies that are already existing today that can provide Italy and Europe with huge opportunities. So we can grab the opportunity like the Frigidaire founder or complain like the people who said the fridge will kill the ice making industry. Well, thank you very much. So we can see that the availability of technology is a reality and it is important. These technologies are continually evolved, but it is also important to make a quick use of them. In Chernobyl, one month ago, you showed a study on the European governance of energy transition. And we could see that in Italy, of all the tenders for renewable energies, only 10% have been, perhaps 200 only, have actually been assigned because the whole system is still moving too slowly. So how can we do what you're actually focusing on? For instance, the recharging the stations for electric mobility. We know that it is not easy to distribute them in our country. Well, you have actually pointed out the issue of red tape and bureaucracy in our country. You're very right. And I'm confident that our government will solve this. But you have also hinted to the fact that networks are the habilitator of the ecological transition. There is a lot of talk of players, the people who kick the ball, who save the goal. So. Unless you've got somebody to prepare the stadium that is a real estate developer, and unless you've got the gardeners to give you a wonderful grass carpet, you cannot play the game. So the grass and the stadium are the habilitator that we need for our ecological transition. I mean, there are already some uh, some uh, recharging stations. We have installed them months ago, but they're not connected to the network. So unless they're enabled to supply energy, uh, they cannot be used. Renewable energy is fantastic. So if it's sunny, you've got the sun energy. If it's windy, you've got wind energy. If it rains, you've got hydroelectric energy. But if you do not have all these three things, you've got no energy. So we hope to have a world that is supplied by only renewable sources, but to do that, we need grids, and these grids must be resilient. Let me quote two examples. Venice, high water 2019, 1.96 meters, zero seconds of blackout of power cut in Venice. Why? because we have worked on the networks and we're very proud of what our colleagues did and nobody realized that. 
Paradoxically, when everything is working well, when people can play their football match, nobody talks about the grass carpet. But when the lawn is not perfect, everybody complains about them. Think about California, the Silicon Valley. Think about the parkas they had in the last year. Due to the fact that their network, their grids are obsolete and they have too much renewable sources. So renewable sources are not enough. Of course, we must improve our production with renewable sources, but from 21 to 23 in our plan, we have invested 8.5 billion euro in Italy for our grids and networks that make renewable sources able to supply energy. That was very clear. Thank you very much. Mr. Cosma Pansaki, can you make us understand how hydrogen can be useful for the decarbonization of our country? Well, hydrogen is a bridge between renewable sources and consumption, especially the consumption that is hard to abate. Hard to abate is our industries, cement producing companies, glass producing companies, paper mills, chemical industries. I mean, these companies, they cannot move from thermal energy to electricity overnight. So through hydrogen, we can gradually replace natural gas, not biogas, which has a zero impact, but we want to replace it with something which is greener. And we should not forget economic sustainability. Somebody mentioned social inequality, so we do not want to import social inequality in Italy, in the sense that if we want to decarbonize, the easiest way is to close down companies to close down the heavy industry, for instance, but we should avoid that and prevent that. So if we want to lighten the impact on our utility bills, because it is true that we have made big step forwards in the renewable industry, but all consumers have supported this. So we really need to consider all this in financial terms and in terms of a step-by-step -step approach. Right, timing is fundamental, and many say hydrogen is the future, but if we want to reach these targets, it won't be ready in time. How do you see this? Well, the European Union has just published the European strategy envisaging the massive use of hydrogen starting from now with significant investments in the field of electrolysis and networks. Let me quote an example. Germany, which is one of the main potential consumers of hydrogen, is already moving at global level to import green hydrogen from Africa, to import green hydrogen from Australia. So there is an opportunity which is clear and present to produce low carbon hydrogen and use it in our companies also to become more independent from import of fossil fuels. Right, another round to identify the priorities for a plan of a sustainable Italy, which is the main topic of our event. And I would like to start from Itachi again. How, I mean, which, which priorities do you see for our country? Well, as we have heard, um, we have to recognize the opportunity, and Nestor said this very clearly, we need to support all the stakeholders, society and citizens so that they understand that this is a unique opportunity for our country. And to make use of this opportunity, we need to work horizontally. We must be ready to integrate new technologies. We must be ready and willing to plan this is very, very important, as our minister said. To attract investments, Laura said, this is one of the critical points. So making the Italian system more attractive to investors. In other words, I believe we have some fabulous competencies in the field of energy. Ernesto has described 
the enormous innovation carried out by Italian companies for this transition being also worldwide leaders. We've got the industries. We've got the capability to innovate and research. We need to develop a system where there is no red tape or where innovation and ambition play the most significant role and perhaps you should be able also to take on a little bit of risk to innovate in this way because of course if you innovate uh, you always have the risk of having to change something but this will pay you back well apparently um, we've got resources now coming to our country we will need private investments we must have new rules and laws and we also need projects do you have any projects that can be included in the national resilience and recovery plan or that go in this direction well of course mobility for instance and we have the opportunity of contributing being the leader in this industry worldwide but also with our local resources we can contribute to the integration development and strengthening of the networks and grids that Ernesto described and there is an aspect that many companies in Italy have been working on including Enel digitization we were saying before that the system today is much more complex than in the past renewable sources and resources need controlling and monitoring systems that are much more sophisticated and also managing the recharging points is not a joke you need software you need process development and this is a challenge that must be taken on horizontally because nobody can take care of all these aspects but for sure we are all willing to go on in this direction very well um, what about you Mrs. Fiorani what about your agenda I mean I know that you uh, know that you have huge works and we know that attempts have been made to unblock many frozen building sites well our plan our program is clear what we need to do by 2026 has been written down and we need to use all the tools that we have available however before concluding this we need to mobilize another economic industry that is on these infrastructures we need mobility services because mobility is managed by a different part of the economic world the regions and the whole world of logistics so I would like to add to the plan element also the aspects of managing mobility for this purpose at the beginning of August we have published an extraordinary edition of our commercial plan related to the Italian plan of recovery and resilience because of course investments are fundamental for designers uh, for technology but then we also need the other side people who need to understand what to do with these infrastructures so which type of services of mobility will be available which opportunities will be there and we have started um, talking about this as soon as the national plan of recovery was approved of so that also that part of the world already today knows which type of services can be organized and the infrastructures that will be available in 2026 everybody hopes that our country uses this window of opportunities to change uh, what about the Salerno Leto Carabria train connection are you optimistic about this? Well, of course I am optimistic. You know, 
we do not expect to do all that in 2026, but we will do the most significant part of it, characterized by the highest level of advantages for passengers. And the government also has some national investments ready to complete another important part of this infrastructure. So 2026, a big commitment, and a big commitment also for 2029. So in 2030, 2031, it will be finished if we obtain the resources. So I'm an optimist, but we're not going to do everything by 2025. Right, which are your opportunities, Mr. Banzaki? Well, our number one priority is making our infrastructure ready to transport green gases quickly at a very low cost. So it is the improvement of the network and of the grid, yes because we want to move towards Africa and the Balkans. Secondly, we want to invest in technology. Everybody talks about this. We have invested in two companies in the field of electrolysis, ITN Power and Enora, and we are creating innovation centers with the most important Italian universities. And we will go on working in this direction. The third and last priority is the system. We have to work as a system in the field of hydrogen and energy transition. You can't work on the vertical level, because nobody has all the necessary competences. So this is how we work also in terms of energy efficiency. Together with CDP, we're working together with many other players. So how do you actually produce hydrogen? Because I know that this is an open and lively debate also in terms of economic sustainability. The way how you produce it changes all the parameters. So which will be the hydrogen Italy is going to use in the future? Hydrogen must be low carbon and sustainable, economically sustainable as well. So being an infrastructure operator, we are committed to transport low carbon hydrogen. Which type of low carbon hydrogen will be on our grids? Well, that depends on economic decisions, also the ones made by our country. Our country can produce competitive blue hydrogen, unlike other European countries. And this would allow us to uh, meet the needs of companies, especially in the Po Valley. I would like to conclude with you. Now, Mr. Chora, because I know that you focus a lot on innovation, starts up uh, and young talents. Uh, we got Youth for Climate today here in Milan with young people coming from all over the world to tell us how they think things should be done. I know that you focus a lot on startups, and so you work with young people. Um, tell us, do you have any special company in mind? Well, I believe that the energy of young people is fundamental. In the last five years, we have analyzed about 10,000 startups with about 400 projects developed, and worldwide about 100 have been developed. Andrea Carcano came to me when his turnover was zero, and now he's the founder of a company that is worth 1 billion euro. So in many cases, these young people started from zero and have proven that ecological transition is a big opportunity. But you need to be humble. Let me say this again, humble. A modern company like ours must know that the best are not in our company and we must get them involved. We must listen to them so that they work with us for our networks, for our infrastructures, for the recharging network. So we should not think about the constraints of change. We should identify the opportunity in change. There is a Chinese proverb saying, when the wind blows, you can either build the wall or build a windmill. Well, we prefer to build a windmill, and these start are the ones who help us kill the old anil and create a new anil every day. Every two years, the skin on our lips changes, otherwise we would die. And every 15 years, 100% of our cells is renewed. So we must be ready to change anil completely, and we can do that thanks to them. So thank you very much. Also, because the next uh, um, presentation will be about innovation, research, and startups. So thank you very much to Mr. Chora, Mr. Panzaki, 
my staff Akin and Mrs. Fiorani. Thanks a lot to all of you. And I was saying that uh, now we talk about how research is important in our country, and without that you cannot achieve any goal. And we do so with a video. Unfortunately, uh, the speaker could not be with us today. And Maria Cristina Carrozza, who is the current president of the uh, National Research Center, the CNR, she is an, uh, a specialist in robotics and bioengineering at the Santana uh, School in uh, Siena. And uh, please go ahead. Good. Uh, afternoon to all of you. I'm the president of the National Research Center. I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, talking about a plan, a sustainability plan for Italy, and I would like to thank them for asking for my contribution. And I think that this topic from the standpoint of the National Council for Research is of paramount importance. The CNR, the uh, National Research Council is highly motivated, highly committed to sustainability, and we do so through our departments and uh, institutes because we want to have a multidisciplinary approach to sustainability, and we want to provide a number of contributions from the different uh, areas of research to be able to tackle both the monitoring of uh, the climate change impact and the relevant consequences from a weather viewpoint, from migration viewpoint, from poverty, the uh, catastrophes that affect the world. And uh, we also want to focus on competencies and skills on the fresh and new knowledge that is required to develop an industrial revolution that has to be sustainable. How can we generate energy, produce new materials, uh, and produce them uh, through circular economy? And this idea is apparently very simple and uh, uh, revolutionary, but is something that will have to be rolled out as we move along, decarbonizing the earth, uh, coming up with new manufacturing system based on uh, circular economy. And this has to be based on scientific research. Think of materials. Our uh, chemical department is, foc department is focusing on a green chemistry program. We want to monitor the environment. We monitor CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And our uh, National Research Council is definitely involved, or if we talk about energy production today, it's really a hot topic. And uh, why is that? Because it's aimed at producing uh, energy at an accessible cost and at the same time clean energy and sustainable energy. And this is really a revolutionary pathway from all perspectives, and I'm sure it will involve, uh, involve uh, all institutions that uh, deal with education and training. As, as far as CNR is concerned, we have thousands of researchers who are aware that this is part, uh, confident that this is part of the essential roadmap for the future development of our research center. Thank you. Maria Chiara Carrozza, president of the CNR, and uh, we talked about research, but let's now focus on uh, one of the fields where we'll have the game of the future, and we are talking about our cities, of course. Minister Cingolani talked about cities. Um, a lot of emissions are generated by cities, 20% of global emissions. What is the future of cities, and what are the main challenges ahead of them? Professor Frey is with us, is an economist, uh, president of Global Compact Italian Network Foundation, connected to the UN, and I would like to ask him to join us and share your view with us, how important uh, are cities, what is the role they can play in that respect. Cities, indeed, uh, will, uh, of course, cater for 80% of the global population when we will have about 10 billion people on Earth. So when we talk about cities, we talk about everything. It, that is not really the case, but we are getting out of a pandemic, uh, and so we have also have a better or a firmer grasp of what we expect cities to do, what we want them to be. We want 
them to be better places to live in. Uh, we want them to go back to something that uh, we lost somehow during the most intense industrialization stage, and we have to support the transition towards sustainability. What is it? that we mean by sustainability when we talk about cities. Where are we heading? Of course, we talked uh, a lot about technology. Technology is a means to achieve something we've defined as sustainability. Sustainability is three-dimensional economic sustainability has already been uh, dealt with because uh, large companies have acknowledged that it is an opportunity for them. And then social sustainability this is something that tells us that we have to do things to uh, be better, live better. Our generation is the first generation to be aware of the fact that our children, future generation, next generations, uh, could have a worse life than we have, could have worse conditions than we have. So how can we uh, make cities uh, more equal places or better places to live? Uh, Let's make sure that the progress we've had over the last uh, 30 days goes uh, or, or heads towards something where we have equality and uh, sustainability. And today we've heard about uh, energy transition and we've heard about uh, sustainable transition or ecology transition. Mobility transition. Mobility is a way to make citizen, cities places where we can move around, however, respecting, uh, respecting not just the environment, but also uh, enabling people to move in a timely way. We know that there are metropolis, there are huge cities where traffic, traffic jams cause a problem and of course they also generate pollution. So we have to come up with new infrastructures, intermodal or nodal uh, infrastructures that turn mobility. Of course, we want to head uh, towards uh, collective mobility. It's not just a problem of electric vehicles. Uh, we Need, as, if, a, a, as a consequence of the uh, 2030 agenda and, and of the uh, recovery and resilience plan, all of these uh, instruments are focusing on mobility, sustainable mobility. And that is also uh, something that is a complement for uh, companies. They start from um, mobility, think of Tesla, and then, uh, of course, they are in favor of renewable sources because th there's a strong interconnection between these two factors. And then there's something else. that The future means putting things together into a system where everything is interconnected, where the challenges are taken into account so that we can best exploit the technologies we have available and the new infrastructures that are being built. And that leads us to two more uh, transition elements. Uh, and one was mentioned, but uh, it was not discussed today, and it's that of circular economy. What do we mean by circular economy? This, uh, it's being able to think about things uh, according to a regenerative rationale. You recover something that you have lost or that you have already used. You use um, things uh, without wasting them, making the most of them. And uh, if we compare this to what Minister Cingolani was saying, it's not that we can go to the uh, less developed countries and um, give them solutions unless we think of the deep contradictions we are ourselves experiencing. And that affects cities as well. So how can we talk about regenerative cities? We have to build the cities in a different way. We have to reuse material that are there, materials that are there. And sometimes they're valuable. We can do what we call up cycling it's not just recycling you recycle but improving enhancing the value of what you have recycled so you upcycle and it's not just a matter of uh, ideally uh, maximizing the use of resources waste waste are a phenomenon that was generated by modern cities um, in the past they were not uh, or in in rural areas they were not there 
and the complexity of the urban world, of course, entailed having more sophisticated systems to manage waste or manage water. But this is a, a, a fundamental factor and in a sustainable city, you also need to take care of that because citizens uh, have to find life quality in anything that's to do with sanitation or resource availability that will more and more well, scant going forward. Think of Israel. They really did a lot in that respect. And they think of water and how they manage it. They, they even drink recycled water. And that component is forcing us to think in a different way. And here you get your four components in the transition process. And it's tied in with the social component. It's the citizen, the consumer. And it has, they have to be engaged in this process. If technology industry 4.0, the digital era, and they are based on interconnections, but at the same time, we have to make sure, they have to make sure that citizens are at the center of all that, and that they make the right choices, that they behave in a way so that the city can be sustainable. And it is this irrenunciable if we want sustainable cities uh, granting a good quality of life. Let me wrap up. Uh, with something that uh, may not seem interconnected. We may think that we live in the best possible world. Think of Italy, because we talk about uh, um, sustainability for Italy. There's a very important plan. We've heard large companies uh, with a strategic vision and companies that can play a, a role in these transformation processes. But Italy is made up of SMEs as well. It's really the foundations of our uh, economy. So we have to find ways through which in innovation processes and innovation dynamics, uh, those who actually carry the goods through the intermodal uh, systems that are being built so that these people can become main characters, play a central role. There are people who are, or small companies that are looking at transformation with a lot of attention, but the main theme is to not leave anyone behind. To, that's the idea of the global uh, uh, compact of global corporate sustainability. And I must say that at global level, uh, a lot is expected of Italy to try and find solutions. And it's not a matter of corporate business model. It's a matter of a business model of the entire industry that is heading towards sustainability. And cities could be a one-of-a-kind place where to put all of these factors together, where you have these buildings called il Bosco Verticale, the vertical uh, uh, with vertical uh, terraces and uh, trees uh, being uh, a paramount part of the building. And uh, uh, we have to leverage the innovation potential of startups. Uh, and they are ready. They are ready to be part and parcel of a new uh, innovation-based ecosystem underpinning sustainability. Thank you, Professor Frey. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you. Let me ask you one question, because you mentioned uh, what happened over the last one and a half years, the pandemic, uh, so to say. And that generated a, a heated debate between architects, urban planners, because we can work everywhere through smart working. But uh, we've seen all these people at the furniture exhibition in Salon del Mobile here in Milan a few weeks ago. So we are all gathered together. Today we are uh, uh, at a headquarter where we have some people working in presence. Uh, but from your perspective, will we go back to using cities as they uh, had been planned in the last 10, 15 years? Skyscrapers, high density uh, living, or will sustainability play a role in changing that? Smart working, uh, cut our daily emissions because there was less mobility. What's your idea? What's your take on this? The transformation we are going through will make sure things will never be as they were before. For sure, we are indeed going through a um, trade-blazing uh, transformation. Uh, 
a one-of-a-kind transformation. You think of smart working and you immediately think of smart cities. And of course, you think of sustainability. Um, you conjure it up through the English word, smart working, smart cities. And smart working told us that there is a different way to work and live. But that uh, doesn't mean uh, cities are less important. On the contrary, uh, we have to use them and live them in a different way. Uh, mobility infrastructure, digital infrastructure, but uh, how work is organized within companies, they all have to go hand in hand with sustainability. Uh, smart working, when well organized, it was beneficial to everyone, including the environment, but things have to be designed, planned ahead, so we have to learn from this lesson. And thank you, Professor Frey. See you soon. And uh, talking about the future of cities from a sustainability perspective, let me call Andrew Bar, Group CEO of Itachi Rail, Vice President and Executive Officer of Itachi LTD, Ari Gozzano, CEO of ATM, Renato Mazzoncini, CEO of A2A, and Nicolaus Lang, Managing Director and Senior Partner of BCG. And co member for Industrial Goods and Automotive Practice, always with BSG and founder of BSG Center for Mobility and Innovation. And uh, I'll start with Nicholas Lang. You've just published a piece of research devoted to the future of mobility in cities. So can you help us uh, better understand uh, uh, the main findings of your research work? Certo, volentieri. Listen to the previous discussion around sustainability in cities and the impact that uh, different levers will have on this. And we have been looking at one lever, which is mobility, which I think fits to the discussion today. And uh, what we looked at were actually 50 cities around the world in which you have every day 1.7 billion trips. So 1.7 billion trips in 50 cities. And what we looked at is what is the impact of mobility that mobility has on the well-being of the cities. And it's amazing to see that you can completely change cities by changing the modal split we have today. So moving from cars to micro-mobility, moving from cars to public transport, moving from public transport to robo-shuttles or robopods. And so what we found out is that the, sus the, the sustainability impact of mobility is huge across cities. We looked at five different dimensions. We looked at cost, we looked at emissions, we looked at health, we looked at congestion, and we looked at space. And let me just share five examples of what we saw in happening in these cities. If in a city like Berlin, you would optimize public transport, and you would go for the best possible scenario. You would save $1.6 billion in transport cost. If you would take a city like Los Angeles and replace cars by more flexible public transport and shuttles, you would reduce 2.7 million cubic tons of CO2. If you would do the right transport mode for London, you would save 100 lives per year. In Hong Kong, you would reduce congest congestion by 20 hours. And my favorite example is New York. When you bring the right transport mix to New York, you save 900 blocks of parking space, which are 10 central parks. So interesting place to think about New York with 10 additional central parks. But I think it just shows that actually the way how we shape mobility in the city of the future is determining how the cities will thrive and how people will live there. in sustainable mobility and with the Itachi point of view on this? Well, in uh, mobility within Itachi, we have uh, two areas that we're focusing on. Uh, one is looking at uh, the way in which uh, rolling stock in particular is powered, and then the other is total control of the whole journey. So looking at alternative power modes uh, has become a major aspect of the future uh, of the transportation system. So 
Of course, electri electrified trains uh, are sustainable in their own right when they're powered from the infrastructure. But where that's not available or it's too expensive to put in place, uh, providing other means such as batteries or hydrogen are a key part of our focus. For Itachi, we focus very much on battery because it's a, a technology which applies itself very much now and fits very much the architecture uh, of our products. But if you look at uh, the, the cues that you get from automotive, it's already something that's re readily used and in place uh, on a daily basis. So it's clearly a technology that is credible uh, and has the capability to power the rolling stock at the moment. So which do you think will be the most sustainable technology in mobility? And do you have any projects in place, also in our country, we're discussing Italy today, and uh, that can be a model or an example, an inspiration for looking ahead? Uh, sure. I mean, in the, in the long run, of course, electric trains uh, are, are the main sustainable mode of transport. Uh, in the interim, we have um, a tram running in Florence at the moment that is battery powered. Uh, and that is a, a, a means of simplifying the system by removing the need for overhead wires. And we have a regional train which is currently running on test, which is also fitted uh, with batteries on a satchel train. So we already have uh, a good uh, reference for these products for the future. Alongside that, hydrogen, I believe, has a place to play, uh, and it's probably a regional base for the use of that. Vengo anche alla parte, come dire, italiana di questo panel per capire innanzitutto per voi eh, che ovviamente avete nel DNA il fatto di affrontare direttamente questa sfida della sostenibilità, rendere sostenibile la, la mobilità, eh, avete anche un piano industriale che punta molto in questa direzione, ma in concreto a che punto siamo, che cosa ci potrà portare anche il PNRR che abbiamo discusso finora? Sì, sì, prego, prego. Sicuramente il tema della mobilità è nel DNA di un'azienda come ATM che si occupa di mobilità urma, di urbana in un'area densamente popolata e con grandi problemi di inquinamento come, come è Milano. Lo facciamo a Milano, lo facciamo anche in tutti gli altri ambiti nei quali operiamo. Chiaramente per noi vuol dire, come dire cercare di eh, rendere la nostra gestione e la produzione del nostro servizio il più possibile libera dalla dipendenza da combustibili fossili e quindi diciamo il flagship, il progetto flagship del nostro piano industriale è la sostituzione di tutta la flotta autobus che oggi è ancora in buona parte diesel in autobus elettrici. Noi siamo, abbiamo un obiettivo al 2030, cioè al 2030 avremo sostituito tutti i 1300 autobus oggi diesel, siamo all'inizio di un percorso, siamo a circa 200 autobus diesel però questo, 200 autobus elettrici, mi scusi, questo vuol dire cambiare tutto il processo industriale, vuol dire fare enormi investimenti. E il for a huge investment and the uh, recovery and uh, resilience plan will help us in that way. We expect 400 million for Milan and for this urban area. And so that will speed up the process indeed. And then it will also depend on how the recovery and resilience instrument will be rolled out. Um, what are you meaning by this? What do you mean? We have procedures and there's an issue there. Uh, it's still very complex uh, to get the, the, the authorizations, the permits, uh, uh, the in-house red tape somehow even. The minister was saying we've cut the authorization uh, uh, process for wind mills and wind farms. Uh, but for us, when it comes to uh, call for tenders uh, um, and, and those who are bidding in those tenders, we've seen, uh, we've witnessed both, experienced both roles, uh, bidding and calling the tender. But it's a long time frame. Are we going to manage it? Are we going to succeed? Yes, of course, we, we need to succeed. But uh, of course, uh, the simplification actions have to be braver, I think. But be quick. Because, of course, we're going to make it. We have to say we're going to make it. But there's a, a practical risk that if we keep or stick to this timing, and we've heard it to, today more than once, uh, A2A, second largest energy producer in uh, Italy. According to you, city sustainability, how do you view it? There's not just mobility, uh, as we are discussing now, but circular economy. Energy. Energy has played a paramount role in our, uh, the debate today. What's the main challenge for you and what are you doing? The main challenge for us 
is the ecological transition. For the first time in history, we have a special ministry devoted to uh, ecological transition, uh, putting together the two stakeholders we normally deal with, the, uh, the Ministry for uh, Development, uh, Social and Economic Development, and the Ministry for the Environment are cooperating for the first time. Uh, of course, we have a debate, but nobody is uh, thinking that uh, 2050 will be fully decarbonized only through electrons. <laughs> uh, that's not possible. Studies tell us that by 2050 we will be able to de decarbonize. Uh, and I keep saying we can make it, but 53. Uh, 55% uh, of electrons and 45% uh, of molecules. Electrons are quite clear. Uh, I, I know where they will come from. Renewable uh, resources, wind uh, energy, sun energy, hydro, green hydro, etc., will play a role. That's the part we know about, so to say, in my part of the brain. And uh, so we get 400 uh, exajoules from the sun, so that solar a lot more than uh, mankind would, did, would need in a year, so it's endless uh, uh, energy. So I'm thinking ahead, 20 years from now, of course, uh, and of course, uh, we will need authorizations, there's red tape, we will get, uh, well, laws will have to be simplified, we will have to uh, speed up installation times by 10, well, tenfold, 10 times, but what will the molecule, the 45% of molecules will come from, so hydrogen and biomethane, and uh, so biogas or sin fuels. Uh, we don't know the breakdown yet, but there we can tie uh, in with circular economy. If we decide that some buses in Italy will run, still run, with uh, conventional engines, the only solution would be to use biomethane, biogas generated with waste. Uh, and in uh, the urban, urban waste, and uh, or waste from farming, but we have to have the technology to do that. And then hydrogen, we are studying how to produce green hydrogen for mobility at uh, accessible prices in order to break even. If you would have a train uh, fueled with hydrogen, you need to have green hydrogen at six, seven euro per kilo. We are currently paying uh, 12, uh, 13 euro per kilo, coming from solar panels. Solar panels were 1,500 year, hours per year. If you put an electrolyzer there, it would have a 20% hot factor, so that is really not maximizing cost efficiency. And so what we are doing is planning and designing, at, and we are at an advanced stage. We are putting an electrolyzer close to our waste to energy plants, and uh, by taxonomy, they produce 50% green energy because 50% they burn uh, biogenic uh, waste, wood, just to mention one. So green energy can be optimized by working with electrolyzers that is uh, uh, on the same site as the WTE, the waste to energy. You don't pay system charges there, so energy is lower. And there you maximize efficiency because the waste to energy is 8,000 hour per year and not 1,500. So it's, uh, the load factor is optimized and the energy cost can be cut by 60% because I'm not paying system charges that today they are paying. We are paying in our uh, energy bills with and 40% is uh, raw material and 60% is system charges. That's how our energy bill is broken down. But, uh, uh, but it's been very hard to build WTE. But how, do we have enough WTEs to do what you are describing? We are assuming that with the waste to energy plants we have today, and the ones that will have to be built over the next few years, we can produce the entire um, quantity of hydrogen that is required for heavy mobility, trucks and buses, so to say, and some trains. And uh, uh, that means uh, uh, producing uh, green hydrogens uh, around uh, seven euro per kilo, which is really the disruption factor. Uh, 
it will make a difference. And when you talked about costs, energy, and how to fuel uh, uh, means of transport, uh, what's your take on the challenge? Um, on uh, electricity, uh, we have a topic we've been discussing for a long time. We are local public transport. So we pay energy almost as uh, private citizens. Uh, we have a tender every year, and uh, we spend 60 million a year uh, in energy, and every year we have a tender, public tender, of course. Uh, and it's normally won by A2A, awarded to A2A. And as I'm a friend, 20-year uh, friendship with uh, uh, Renato, and uh, after the uh, uh, tender is awarded, I call Renato for a last effort. Uh, let me finish, let me finish first. <laughs> so I call Renato up, and, and so the sales, uh, head of sales of A2A calls my head of sales, and they tell me, well, we gave you a further discount of 15,000 euros. <laughs> so it's, it's either, either uh, Renato is not my friend, or, <laughs> and that could be one uh, thing, but the other one is probably that, as we were saying before, the cost of uh, electricity is determined by mainly tax charges or uh, system charges that cannot be further compressed by system operator, shrunk by system operator. So uh, even electri electric mo mobility or um, hydrogen production, especially for heavy mobility or uh, out of town mobility. So uh, in, uh, right now it's not uh, economically sustainable. We have to lay the foundations for the system to withstand the pressure. Public transportation is genetically has very low margins. If we introduce uh, further cost elements, uh, uh, you have a problem. So uh, energy coming from renewable sources is too expensive for you. Yes, electricity in particular. And electricity generated through renewable sources cannot meet the base load requirements ATM has. Uh, at TM, ATM, they need energy 24, 20 hours out of 24, and the base load factor is uh, generated by gas plants, thermal plants. Uh, we have done, with, done away with coal, so some combustible uh, oil. So solar panels uh, uh, and uh, Wind farms only maybe work at night. Solar works during the day, but for base load factor and base load production, we can only ensure us through hydro. Through hydro, we are the second largest hydro producer in Italy. So that's how we can ground the base load. Uh, today, large companies as ATM, they cannot have uh, a real uh, cost efficient. Uh, uh, um, energy offering. Uh, in some uh, hours of the day, we can uh, provide energy with exceed solar energy. In other times of the day, we have to grant the energy supply through hydro plants. 70% of the energy produced in Italy is through hydro plants. We have the hydro turbines, and we can close them and open them, and it's very expensive. And you have a shareholder in common, luckily enough. Otherwise, what would things be like? Let, I'll leave you to discuss it uh, I'll, so that you have the next uh, prices for the next tender. I think uh, cities have a large part to play. Uh, the other key technology that we're developing is so-called mobility as a service, which is digital management of people's journeys. And I think that enables you to manage demand in a much better way. So total control of the journey end to end across the different modes within eight large cities is one of the major ways you can actually bring more people into the city in a sustainable way. So. Uh, to, to make people do that, you've got to make poterlo fare, eh, dobbiamo creare un'alternativa credibile, quindi dare online e gestire quindi tutto il viaggio fino all'arrivo in ufficio. Questa è una parte fondamentale. Quindi la tecnologia c'è, la stiamo sviluppando e questa fa parte di una fase importante del 
which is also encouraged us to look at other adjacencies to our core business. So we've heard talk today about other power modes, particularly uh, electric buses, and we're looking at how they can be linked together into our own systems to get the maximum usage and the maximum utilization from those. But how about the solutions and looking at the future? Wh what can be done? Well, maybe just building on what Andy said before, um, I think that there we will see two major trends happening on the mobility area. One is a more diverse set of uh, transport modes. Yeah, Today, essentially, we have tramways, we have buses, we have subways, we have cars. But if you look at the emergence of micromobility, kick scooters, e-bikes, e-mopeds will definitely be complementing this. This will happen. This is happening now. I think in five to ten years we will have autonomous robo shuttles, autonomous robopods coming, the eight to fifteen seaters that will replace our big buses. So I think that's one element: new transport modes. The other one, and uh, uh, I don't want to copycat any what you just said, but I think there is an element which is very important: is an optimization of the transport journey, yeah, an end-to-end -end transport journey where I do my planning of the transport, where I can choose different transport modes, ticketing, payment, everything online. And let me just add one point just to show the potential of this. If we were, if we were able to give every car driver a parking lot when he is starting his journey, we would reduce traffic in the city by 10%. Because here in Milan or in Paris or in London, on average, 8 to 16% of the cars you see on the road are looking for a parking spot. So if we are taking these 8 to 16% off the road because we tell them where they can park, you have a massive improvement. In different hats, of course. Uh, let's uh, talk about mobility now. The decarbonized mobility, fully decarboni full decarbonization by 2050, 40% will come from electrifying transportation, 30% will stem, 30, 31% will stem from other uh, combustible uh, fuels, sorry, uh, methane, etc., and 8% will come from uh, eight. Uh, mobility uh, optimization, mobility as a service. That will be 30%, will give a 30% contribution to decarbonizing mobility from here to 2050. We've talked about this. How do you see the future of mobility, Mr. Jana? Mobility at a service. Uh, how do you see it in uh, ATM? This is another uh, big topic we've been discussing lately, and uh, the approach is to uh, make public transportation competitive, be it individual or collective, versus uh, uh, the private uh, transportation means. So mobility as a service means making available to those who have to move about providing them with uh, uh, integrated platforms, provided information so as to simplify their journey using different uh, uh, transport modes. And they have to be transparent when it comes to the client needs. One single transaction, when they buy the tickets, they have to be able to ask to access different types of uh, uh, transport modes with the same ticket. And many are moving along those lines. Uh, what we are trying to do is uh, to apply that uh, uh, to that of Greater Milan. Uh, and we're doing so involving other players, other operators, because public transportation like ours accounts for uh, well, look, is the backbone of the public transportation system, but then it has to be integrated with micro mobility, uh, bike sharing, car sharing, you name it, uh, and other transportation mode, rail, for instance, transportation. And that is the challenge we are taking up, and uh, the PNRR, the Italian uh, Recovery and Resilience plan is devoting a lot of attention to technology applied to mobility and so this is a very favorable moment in time for that so you see mobility in other large cities uh, and you compare your mobility with that of other cities copenhagen for instance there you manage one of their um, metro lines what can you draw from that experience 
uh, let me say the following. The experience we uh, have in Copenhagen uh, was a very successful partnership between uh, ATM and Itachi. So we have to say that. Uh, and it was a major experience we accrued together. It was a pool of companies, each one with a dedicated type of know-how, and that led to a, a big success case. Uh, let me remind you that we've been in Copenhagen for a number of years now. Uh, uh, ATM and Itachi, and uh, we have managed. Well, we were awarded a number of tenders uh, after the initial one, where there was a, a, a big technology content, and we are still winning and being awarded tenders. So we have a consolidated franchise there, and, and that's why I'm telling you the partnership, uh, the partnership with among players with high competencies and skills leads to success cases. Copenhagen is the benchmark for uh, a number of things, so sustainability, mobility approach, uh, approach to mobility, and it's a very interesting experience indeed, and the level of quality, uh, their the transportation services we are offering in Copenhagen is comparable to that of Milan, definitely. So Milan and Copenhagen uh, against the global uh, scene, against the global backdrop, are still, both of them, uh, benchmarks, examples. Mm -hmm. So this is a valuable factor indeed uh, that is proving how synergies between great players can generate value for the players and for the citizens. Uh, Copenhagen, of course, is a, a, a project we worked on for a very long time uh, and it's proved that you can actually get two partners with specific skill sets to work together and actually develop something which becomes world-class as a metro. Uh, and that is a, a very good example of the sort of system that we'd very much like to have in the future. If you link that to the mobility as a service that we've been talking about, it becomes a very powerful tool. One of the other differences in Copenhagen, of course, is it's, it's automatic, it's driverless. So it becomes a very controllable system for the future. So. Um, this is a, a good uh, learning experience, but also it's become a template for some of the other operations that we have around the world. Allora, intanto ci stanno seguendo 600 persone online in questo momento. Ringraziamo tutti perché ci abbiamo adesso un momento anche. I would like to thank everyone. Let's start from this panel with the key uh, takeaways, so to say. And we uh, let's go back to the title: Race to Zero: How to Build a Sustainability Plan for Italy. What are the priority, Mr. Massoncini? hands-on experience. Uh, let me say that uh, our priority is to um, have a green energy supply available uh, because that is the big enabler. And, uh, um, and right now, the fact that there's a strong concentration on developing uh, uh, renewable resources, uh, the development of batteries is also very important because they are the uh, actual bottleneck in the process right now. So there's a lot to be done there yet. And uh, we know that it's a huge challenge. I assume we will need uh, uh, giga uh, factors, uh, uh, 30 in Europe and about 106 giga factories and 160 in the world. Um, and then uh, uh, second priority I see is that of grids or networks. Uh, uh, Mr. Chara mentioned that before and it's very important. In, in Milan, just to give you an idea, over the next 10 years, we have to double the energy power. We, go, we have to go from 1.7 giga to 3 gigas, uh, with a little less than 2 billion worth of investment uh, just for the Milan grid. And the Milan grid, uh, starting from 1975 until 2016, uh, no primary station uh, were uh, built uh, so uh, to really feed the grid. Now in uh, uh, seven, eight years, we have to double the number of primary stations and uh, then also the number of secondary stations, 2,000 kilometers of electric uh, uh, lines. It's an investment that's similar of, to that required for two metro lines. Uh, well, the Milan citizens, uh, of course, they want to have the metro, but and they know how much how expensive it is to build a metro, but they have no idea uh, what it takes to uh, build four major stations, like four uh, soccer fields, uh, and. Uh, 
otherwise, and we need to build them, otherwise we'll never have uh, electric mobility or decarbonized systems. And then the third priority is that of circular economy. Uh, a circular economy is essential. Think of batteries, for instance. In Italy, we have no raw materials, uh, and we are a country and in the circular economy still we are still uh, adopting a circular economy uh, as a system as an example steelworks are using that now and uh, we have no cobalt we have no lithium we have no nickel but if we can rapidly build um, battery recycling plant we will have our own mines at home we will uh, acquire vehicles uh, that will have Chinese batteries probably, but once the batteries get here, we keep them, <laughs> we're not giving them up. And so we recycle them, we extract according to the targets provided by the uh, EU, 95% uh, recycling on uh, nickel and cobalt, 80% on uh, lithium. And these uh, uh, plants have to be built, but we will have a recycling pipeline. And this how we see that circular economy is of paramount importance. Our economy is recovering and restarting. Last year, there was a, a reduction in emissions of, because of COVID. What do your uh, indicators say about the energy demand? The energy demand really skyrocketed, but we should not associate this uh, energy demand to also price increases. I, in my opinion, the price increase, energy price increase today is really uh, somehow a tail effect of the fossil fuel uh, impact uh, or uh, reaction to the adoption of renewables somehow. And uh, we had a 55% uh, objective uh, concerning uh, renewable energies, but all of a sudden the gas coming from other countries, the gas price is skyrocketing three times. Uh, all of a sudden we got less gas, uh, European reserves were low, and we got this uh, for the law and demand, law, uh, for the supply and demand law, prices skyrocketed. But I think it's one of the few last few times where geopolitics uh, is affecting energy and the message is clear we have to speed up on renewables and when i hear people say oh look at the cost of energy look at the cost of transition that is not true i think they're not being intellectually honest when they say so it's very dangerous thank you for leaving uh, us with this thought but now you said the metro line and uh, citizens are unhappy if they cost a lot, but then they're happy they have to have the metro taking them around the city. Uh, above and beyond the, in the time it takes to build a metro line, they change uh, depending on the different uh, um, uh, project rollouts. But going back to your question, the uh, implementation or rolling out capacity, right now we've heard about it a lot. Uh, and. Uh, we are willing to do it, but what is lacking, what is missing from our perspective is uh, having the right uh, uh, implementation capacity. Companies have the right implementation capacity, not politics. So we have to come up with something innovative uh, in the relationship between public and private players, those who have to uh, plan development ahead, fund development, and those instead who have to actually take the practical steps for that to happen. And uh, uh, we should not be prey of uh, whatever happens in the tendering world. We should be able to, uh, well, the government should be, or the public uh, uh, entities should be able to leverage the implementation abilities uh, uh, companies have to uh, go ahead. We, we should go beyond the current regulation and laws. Yes, well, I think, as I said uh, in my introduction, I think there is a lot at stake, Yeah, whether it's uh, cost, congestion, health, um, obviously also the topic of space in cities, which will be completely redefined. But I have two thoughts when we look about how to make it happen, yeah? because we're now talking very often about theory and data. I think going forward we will need two things. First, we will need much more public-private partnerships. Yeah? I think cities have evolved from 
the 20th century where they were controlling and forbidding to cities that are shaping. And I think those shaping cities require private partners to really work uh, hand in hand. That's, I think, number one. Number two, I think, if we really want to be revolutionary and disruptive in mobility, we need to be much more daring when it comes to new mobility projects, be it on rail, be it on road, be it in the air. And I personally think that when we look at cities in Asia or in Middle East, I think uh, the good old European cities can learn a lot about the way how to implement these disruptive pilots. Yes, definitely. Both in terms of sustainability and innovation. Yes. You were mentioning bots uh, as one of the forms of bots that yes. people around. Do you think there's already any project which is currently working that we can look at from Singapore to wherever? Yes, definitely. I think you have cities in China, in Asia Pacific, that are in Southeast Asia. You just mentioned Singapore or Chengdu or other cities that are really uh, looking at uh, how to implement autonomous transport. Yeah, and I think Singapore has been running autonomous bus pilot transports. Yeah, as has Chengdu, and I think that's where this, the disruption will come from. I think, yes, very much so, along the lines of, of what Nicholas just said. Um, if we're going to plan for, for 2030 or even 2050, the asset life, we really need to start thinking about that now. So getting those decisions made is really important. So the planning needs to go into that now for the hardware to be powered in the right way. And then in supporting the development of the cities, it, again, is also important. If you think about... Uh, transportation links CO2, over 75% of that comes from cities. So we need to make sure that they're managed in the right way. Technologies such as smart city enable uh, the control of the journey and also the management of that power source in the city centre to be done in the right way. So globally there are now many references and I think it's right that we, we pull those together to get the best to enable them to be informing the future. We thank all the panelists, Andrew Barr, and Arrigo Gianna, Nicholas Lang, and Renato Mazzoncini. And uh, let's now uh, somehow sum up and uh, wrap up. Uh, Alistair Dormer from Itachi, please join me. Alice, so we know we have a big challenge. There's, there's that recognition now that we're at the point where we really need to embrace the challenge. And what I see from that is tremendous opportunity. So from everyone that has spoken today, we've talked about you know, the energy transition challenge, the strengthening of our, our uh, electrification system, the challenges in cities, the challenge for mobility. Uh, and as you know, Hitachi... As, as a big investor in, in Italy, we're very excited about being part of that uh, solution. Uh, and I think what we'd really like to come next from you know, the discussions at COP26 is how do we form those partnerships? How do we, uh, we, we haven't got all the technology, you know, let's be honest, no company has. But we've seen uh, from you know, the minister being very open about public and private partnership. There'll be many companies out there, and, and people talked about startups, that have the innovation because we need speed. So let's form those partnerships, let's build on that roadmap, and let's achieve what we set out to do. Fantastic. Thank you so much, also, Alistair Dormer, for this conclusion.
we'll keep discussing this as Itachi is one of the principal partner of COP26. Indeed. If I'm right. And uh, grazie a tutti per averci seguito. La discussione è aperta, continua. Thank you for following us, following this debate. It is a fundamental debate also in view of the Road 20 and the Co-op 26. I would like to thank you all those who were connected remotely and those who were here at the BCG headquarters. See you soon. Thank you so much.